They all crest, grown close in rows like this. If the rows were made up of plants from the same family, their leaves would bend away from the row, looking like they were trying to get away from one another. In the rows where they were from different families, they didn't seem to do this so much. Bending away like this will decrease the amount of light they're blocking for a neighbor, but they end up blocking light for themselves. It looks like they're trying to help their neighbors at their own expense, but only for relatives. It seems to be a plant that cares about family. Let's look at some important things that happen to DNA. Segments of DNA are used as the design for proteins, and pretty much everything that happens in a cell is done by proteins. So DNA ends up being the code for everything that a cell will be, do, and build. DNA gets copied, one copy of which is to go into another cell, and eventually DNA and the cell will fall apart. Replicating is why we're all here, why cells don't just die and we all go away forever. It's the cells that can replicate more or more reliably that we should expect to see more of. A gene can code for proteins that can do any number of things. But if it does something that helps the cell reproduce, like makes the cell chase after resources it can use, or run away from dangers, then that gene will be reproducing more, because the cell is reproducing more. Even though it may be having negative impacts on the reproduction of that cell, like using up resources to make that protein, if it has a net benefit for reproduction, then we should expect this gene to reproduce more. And we should see more genes like that. In reality, how a protein is going to help or hurt reproduction has to do with the environment it interacts with, including the other proteins of that cell. What works and doesn't work for reproduction is always changing, and it's hard to predict and quantify. Here we're just talking hypothetically. Genes that code for proteins that have a net cost on reproduction, like making the cell swim in a circle for no reason, or if this protein when excreted is followed by predators like a breadcrumb trail, those genes would be reproducing less and we should expect to see less genes like that. So then how can we see proteins that are helping other cells reproductively at the own expense. That's a waste of resources. Cells with these genes should reproduce less and that trait should go away. But if this mutation came earlier and the cell was produced through mitosis and they were genetically identical, then this protein is reproductively helping DNA that designs that protein. As long as the reproductive benefits are greater than the reproductive costs, that code should do okay, even though it's not helping the exact DNA molecule that was worked from to assemble it. Let's say the proteins these genes code for will guarantee a copy of a cell for whatever reason. Whether a protein is guaranteeing a copy in the cell it came from, or a protein is guaranteeing a copy in another identical cell, the same number of copies are made. The effect on the replication of a gene would be the same, because DNA is ultimately going to fall apart. Whether that DNA will continue is about whether the protein it codes for helps it leave behind more copies. Both of these genes would be accomplishing that, and we should expect to see proteins that help other cells, just like we see proteins helping the cell they came from. But if it guarantees a copy in this stranger cell, a cell that doesn't share the gene, it's not helping itself reproduce. That gene isn't there when it tries to help that cell, and it's always or resources. The other cell needs to share that gene, and we shouldn't expect genes that help strangers to do very well. One example is slime mold. Single-celled protist usually goes about doing its asexual single-cell thing, eating, asexing. When the food runs out, they get together with thousands of cells and form these fruiting bodies. The cells at the top will produce spores that can survive without food for a while. Being up a little stem means they can be picked up easier by things like passing insects or ingested and excreted, and then deposited somewhere where there's food. In the right conditions, the spores will form single-celled slime molds again. The bottom cells of the fruiting body die and won't reproduce anymore. But because the top cells are clones, whatever genes are involved in that behavior are actually reproducing better because of it. So we should continue to see that behavior. From the perspective of reproducing code, a few cells dying doesn't really matter. It's kind of like the cells that make up humans. Most of our cells aren't going to reproduce for very long, but body cells will continue to exist because they're helping the reproduction of the sex cells that carry the same DNA. Reproductively, our bodies are kind of like slime mold bottom cells. But the relationship is a little bit different when there's sex cells in the mix like between parent cells and children cells. Chromosome pairs get split up with meiosis and combined with someone else's at sexing. For a chromosome, on average only half of the offspring are going to share that same DNA. And the same goes for siblings. On average only half of the siblings are going to share any given chromosome. What this means for genes is that any given gene that's helping the offspring cells reproduce is only helping a copy of itself on average half as often, compared to a gene that's helping the bunch of cells it came from. When it's not helping a copy, it's basically helping a stranger. It's a waste of resources. So a gene that tries to help an offspring or a sibling will have on average half the reproductive benefit because of all the times it's not helping a copy of itself. Or maybe you can think about it like, if a gene guarantees an offspring for this mass of cells, on average there is a 50% chance that the offspring will have that gene. So for the gene, it's really only guaranteeing on average half a copy. If it guarantees an offspring for one of its offspring, without knowing which offspring shares that gene, it's really only going to guarantee on average a quarter of a copy of the gene. Because on average only a quarter of those grandchildren are going to share any given chromosome. The idea of a gene guaranteeing an offspring doesn't really make any sense, but that doesn't really matter. The idea is just that, proportionally, a gene that's helping 
an offspring, parent, or sibling is getting relatively less reproductive benefit than it would helping itself. So we wouldn't expect genes that help family members to reproduce as well, and they would be less common. Genes that help grandchildren, cousins, grandparents, and other more distant relatives would be even less prevalent, but still more prevalent than genes that help strangers. With mitosis, a gene can give equally good reproductive benefit to its copies, as it can to itself. But reproductive benefits are reduced between meiosis relatives because chromosomes are getting split up. Would an offspring ever help their parents reproduce? Offspring cells are the ones that have to continue the code. So if cells age and die, shouldn't the helping genes only go towards the offspring? And otherwise it would be counterproductive to long-term reproduction? It does make a certain sense, especially for us. We put a lot of work into taking care of our kids. We're mammals. We have appendages that shoot out liquid child caring. Yes, if a gene makes them help the parents reproduce, and then never reproduce themselves, they would go extinct. But if some of the offspring do reproduce at some point, then a helping parents gene can pass on, in the same way we've been talking about. And you're starting to get something that looks like the social structure of bees, ants, termites, and other animals. With the European honeybee, the queen's worker children gather food for her and the hive. A queen may live on average three to four years, and she'll create hundreds of thousands of workers throughout her life. Workers will only live weeks to months, and most of them won't reproduce. New queens are produced from young workers and from a queen's drones that go off and mate with other queens. So reproduction in these bees is sort of carried out queen to queen. The workers assist that relationship by helping the queen and her drones. They also help feed and raise the new workers. Those workers can then go on to help the queen, the drones, and new workers, so that those workers can go on to help the queen, the drones, and the new workers, and so on. Okay, while you can trace the line of reproducers from mother queens to daughter queens, the majority of the bees only live to help their parents and siblings, and there doesn't seem to be much helping offspring behaviors. They seem to be helping their parents live and reproduce more reliably. Whether a protein results in the reproduction of its gene in the cell that assembled it, or another cell, whether those cells are attached or separated, they're causing the DNA that designed that protein to reproduce. This seems to be a big part of why we see family. Why Belding's ground squirrels will risk making alarm calls about ground predators much more frequently when with family. Why white-fronted bee-eater offspring will often stay and help their parents with their new kids rather than leave and make a nest of their own. Why a dominant male turkey's brother will help scare away other male turkeys and give a backup display for his brother, but not mate with any of those females himself. It's genes in one cell that have had an effect that reproduced those same genes in another cell. But then, if my cells have family caring genes, and your cells have family caring genes, why don't we just treat each other as family? Surely if a woman were to nurse any other human, not just their family, that's mammary glands helping the genes from mammary glands reproduce. Why don't we see that? You know, why are we talking about the probability a gene will be shared? Why can't they just identify which offspring has that gene? And otherwise, how do proteins and cells recognize what other cells are family? How does that dumb plant do it? And how did those bees become non-breeding workers? If they're not clones of their future reproducing siblings the way slime mold cells are. I'm gonna leave these with you. There's some additional information on this and some other stuff in the side notes below. This episode is brought to you by Hamilton's Grass-Fed Human Milk, Huma Mama Yama Liquid Human Milk.